So let's go. All righty. So uh, Chris and Dewan, let me hand it over to you to start. Okay. Um, well, I'll start. So my name is Chris Lambert. I'm the founder and CEO of Life Remodeled. And for those of you who don't know what we do, we revitalize neighborhoods in Detroit. And we focus on one four square mile at a time. We invest about five years in that neighborhood. We do three things. We mobilize 10,000 volunteers every year to beautify the surrounding area. We repair owner occupied homes and we repurpose a school building and turn it into a one stop shop of opportunity. But the heart of our mission is what we're gonna be getting into today is we believe that the main reason urban poverty continues to exist in America is because we have not yet learned how to play well with each other across race and socioeconomic differences. So our mission is bridging people across divides to help transform each other's lives. And I just wanna turn it over to Dewan though, before we move forward, because no one has taught me more about how black and white America can really learn to love one another. And um, you know, I, I love the relationship that uh, Stephen and Nolan have um, Dewan and I, though, happen probably to agree on a whole lot of things, and it's probably because he's taught me so much, and I've just learned to uh, glean from his wisdom. But I just want to say thank you, Dewan, for who you are and what you do. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to dive into the discussion, uh, like an ongoing discussion, more of a way of life uh, for Chris. Um, and myself. So we were really excited with the opportunity to, to bring uh, Nolan and Stephen in uh, to share what they do uh, with some of our friends and followers. Um, I'm Vice President at Life for Modeled. My name is Dewan Dandridge and I um, have had the pleasure of being on this crazy journey uh, with Chris Lambert, um, the, the visionary for what, what Life for Modeled is and working in a space uh, like Detroit that has, um, you know, crazy opportunity for um, and, and just development and change, but also a, a history uh, that's rich, but also rooted in um, one, one of the ways I put it was like Life Remodeled now has a 10 year history of doing some amazing things in, in the city of Detroit. But uh, one of the things I told him early on was what he's up against um, people that look like him having a 400 history of doing some real damnable things in places like Detroit. And we remember that a lot more than we remember um, Life for Models small, um, you know, sample size when it comes to the work that we've been doing. So um, that's always uh, at the forefront of the way that we move and making sure that we respect uh, the people in the communities that we work in. And I think that I've, I played maybe a small part in, in identifying some blind spots on this journey. Um, so with that being said, I want to turn it over to Lynn. That's not true. You played a massive <laughs> part, but, that, but everything else was true. <laughs> well, we, um, we were glad and excited to, to, to invite you guys into this space. And I want to turn it over to Lynn so that she can uh, set us up with the rules of engagement and we can get, it st get started. Awesome. So thanks so much, you guys, for having the Civility Project here. Um, I'm just a facilitator. Stephen and Nolan are going to lead the conversation, but I'd like to make sure that everybody has their microphone muted if you are not a speaker. And the chat is the place where I'd like to hear from you. So questions that you have um, that you'd like Stephen and Nolan to address as we're going forward, um, please put them in the chat and I promise you I will get to them and present them in the conversation. So without further ado, I'd like Stephen and Nolan to kick it off and just quickly introduce themselves and the idea behind the Civility Project and then we'll get going. Can we go first, Nolan? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. What? You go ahead. No, I said go on. Oh, go on. All right. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Stephen Henderson. Uh, I play a number of different media roles around town here in Detroit. Um, uh, I have a daily talk show on public radio, WDET, a couple of talk shows on public television, Detroit public television. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, the founder of the Tuxedo Project, uh, which is uh, a literary arts and community center that I founded in the home where my family lived. Uh, when I was born. Uh, and that's actually how I met Chris Lambert uh, was uh, through 
through Life Remodeled uh, and, and the Tuxedo Project, we, we always seem to be operating in, in adjacent spaces uh, around the city. Uh, one day we're going to get it all together and do something big uh, together. Um, uh, the Civility Project uh, is, uh, is something that I've been working on for a couple of years now with uh, my friend Nolan Finley. Um, who is um, who is my friend uh, across a great divide of uh, experience and perspective uh, and and belief, um, and it's something that I think we're both pretty proud of the fact that that we are friends uh, despite all of those real profound differences uh, between us. Um, it's a friendship that dates back now about 12 years uh, to when I returned to Detroit. Uh, I was uh, away being a journalist uh, in, in other communities for for about 15 years, and I came home uh, in, in 2007 uh, and met Nolan, um, who was uh, the editorial page editor at the Detroit News, and I was the editorial page editor at the Detroit Free Press at the time. Uh, and And there was kind of a natural yin and yang there, right? Uh, uh, this kind of opposites that, uh, that people liked to, to set up and, and kind of uh, showcase. Um, uh, but, but Nolan and I also became friends uh, across the time that we were And the Civility Project is uh, our effort to, to try to share the, the, the tenets of that friendship, uh, the basis for that friendship with other people and see if there are ways that uh, that other people can do the same thing. I mean, Nolan and I uh, talk about a wide range of things. Uh, uh, we can argue about a wide range of things. Uh, and we do it uh, on television uh, for a living some of the time. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, there are some there are some ground rules to that to that interaction uh, that I think both of us um, really treasure and and they prevent it from becoming um, they prevent it from becoming personal they prevent it from becoming uh, destructive uh, they prevent it from becoming a reason not to engage with someone who you don't agree with uh, and so a few years ago um, uh, a few years ago when when StoryCorps uh, which is an NPR project was in town uh, collecting stories of people, individual stories of people here in Detroit. Uh, they, they, they said, uh, come on down to the Detroit Institute of Arts where they had set up a, a little Winnebago and uh, a microphone. And uh, they said, come you know, bring your, your, your person down here to tell the story of your relationship. Uh, most people brought family members uh, or their spouses, uh, but I brought Nolan with me. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him that what I wanted him to, what I wanted us to do was sit and talk about why we believe the things we believe, where those beliefs come from, um, how, we, how we became the people we are. I didn't want us to sit there and talk about the things we disagreed with or the things we agreed with each other on. I wanted to really get at where it all comes from because I believe that that is the way to kind of really understand somebody and really understand what their politics or their beliefs are about is knowing where it all, where it all originates. Uh, and so we had about an hour conversation that we both thought was pretty interesting. I think we both learned a lot about each other. Uh, during that conversation. And so we, we have been trying to sort of share that experience and get other people to indulge in that experience uh, with people they, they don't necessarily agree with. Um, uh, and uh, that was kind of where the Civility Project was born. We spent the last few years uh, trying to share that with lots of other groups. Uh, and today is, uh, is when we're going to talk to you about it. And before Nolan jumps in, I just want to um, shout out to Delta Dental because without them, we wouldn't be here. So thank you so much for sponsoring the Civility Project and guiding us every step of the way. So I want to make sure everybody knows where it comes from. Nolan, let's hear from yeah. you. We really appreciate Delta Dental Plans of Michigan, good corporate citizen, uh, doing a lot of good work in the communities they serve, including this community. We sure appreciate them 
taking on this project and allowing Steve and I to continue our discussions. And, you know, as Steve pretty much went through our history and how this came about, and I would add to that, you know, when, when we first started, people thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun? I was the conservative editorial page editor at the Detroit News, been there 45 years, 20 years on the editorial page. Steve was the liberal editorial page of the Detroit Free Press. People thought it'd be fun to throw us together and watch us fight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we did. We argued a little, but I don't think it ever occurred to us, at least it didn't to me, that we couldn't be friends. I enjoyed Steve. I enjoyed his company. Didn't agree with his politics, but I enjoy reading his, his pieces. And I enjoyed seeing his perspectives and his opinions for a lot of different reasons. Um, I've never been someone who wanted to shut myself off from opinions I disagree with. I find uh, dissenting opinions, contrary opinions to mine, very useful in helping me sharpen my own viewpoints, but also in challenging my own viewpoints. And I've never assumed uh, at any point in doing this job that I'm right. You know, I always want to sort of go through the process of finding out whether I'm right. And talking to someone you disagree with, reading and listening to opinions uh, civilly presented that you disagree with is a good part of that process. And, you know, it never occurred to me that this was someone I couldn't be friends with. I couldn't come to love and enjoy the company just because we had different politics. And, you know, it became, in the beginning, it sort of offended a lot of people. How could you two be friends? I tell the story every time we do this about being on Mackinac Island with Steve during the Michigan Republican Convention several years ago. I think it was when he first came on board as, as editorial page editor. And, you know, it was obviously a uncomfortable place for him uh, to be, but we're standing in a bar and we stand in bars a lot. Uh, we'll disclose that up front. But, you know, we're talking to each other and I walk away and these two women I knew grabbed me and said, oh, how could, we just hate him. How could you talk to him? We just hate Steve Henderson. I said, do you know Steve Henderson? They said, no, we read him. And I said, well, why don't you go over there and, and talk, introduce yourself, talk to him. And they did that. And two hours later, I had to peel them off of him. And they walked away saying, oh, he's so wonderful. And, you know, it, did, it was just a lesson that people are more than their politics and people are more than their opinions. Uh, and if you take the time to get to know the full person, to get to know the person uh, you disagree with, it's harder to hate them. They were convinced they hated him until they talked to him. And, you know, that's sort of sunk in for me then, and I molded on it for the, you know, the following years and, until we started this ability project that we could, we may not come to agreement in this country, uh, universal agreement. We may never want to do that, but we can diffuse a lot of the hatred that is driving the, the divisions and the ugliness in this country. We just learn to talk to each other. And that's what, uh, we've committed to do in this project and we're still learning ourselves. We don't always get it 100% right, but we always come back and try again. So thanks, so, thanks again for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. So um, we will get in this session to some tips about how we can build civility, each yeah. of us in our own circles. I think we should just jump right into um, some very big issues facing us. So you know, when we planned this, we were focusing more on the pandemic and the incivility that was coming up around that. And then the past few weeks, you know, we were, were really focused on race and um, race relations and just a long history of injustice in our country. And so I think we should just start there and talk about how in the world can we ever think of building civility when we're facing such big issues. So maybe you guys can provide some insights and then I invite anybody to put their questions that they'd like Stephen and Nolan to answer in the chat and uh, we will get to them, but maybe let's start there and, and see where it goes. Well, thanks, Lynn. Um, Steve, you don't mind, I'll start with that one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, I sense, you know, a, there's a different feel to what's going in, on now than some of the sort of past um, uh, eruptions of frustration and rage we've seen in this country. This one seems uh, like it's here to stay, but it also seems uh, there's a different feeling, I think, from the non-African-American community that I sense, at least, and I may be naive, 
but there seems to be a desire here for people to learn more and do better and to get past this. That seems to be much more widespread. I'm looking around at these suburban communities holding marches. I've never seen that before. Not just, you know, their black residents, but you know, the, their white residents and white residents who aren't necessarily their liberal residents. But just, just a, a, you know, I'm, I'm surprised at some of the people, you know, I know and who, who I never thought would participate in something like this, and they are. So there seems to be a willingness to learn and talk, and I think that's healthy. I also think there's that people don't know how to talk particularly about this subject. And I would say finally that it is a very dangerous time uh, to talk in some people's mind or, you know, or, or maybe in reality. We see over and over again, one of the disturbing things I see is the number of people who, who want to express support and want to you know, be part of this change getting slapped down because their words weren't quite right. And I think that's something, uh, you know, we have to discuss today and maybe, you know, maybe work on because, you know, it is uh, a fraught subject, always has been, and you've got to move people beyond the fear of talking. Um, so, so I, I mean, I've been, of course, giving a lot of thought to the things that are going on right now in Detroit and, and other cities and talking a lot about them, but I've also been trying to give a lot of thought to the role and the, the I guess, the opportunity that civility provides uh, at, at a moment like this. Uh, and and I, I want to, you know, say up front that, you know, like a lot of people, um, I find it really difficult, uh, really difficult to process all of it uh, and really difficult to, to, to kind of decide how all of this fits together. Um, but I do have some things that, that I think are, are really important uh, when you're thinking about these kinds of things and you think about civility. So one of the, one of the uh, sort of baseline dynamics I think you have to have in any civil exchange between two people who sit on the other side of, of an issue um, is, is an equality of sort of skin in the game and a quality of stakes. What, what's at stake for you has to be equal to what's at stake for me. Um, and that's where I think in this uh, discussion that we are having in this country right now, it's really hard uh, to find that. Uh, African Americans uh, have far more uh, at risk here in this conversation and in these, uh, uh, in all of these dynamics, uh, than other Americans do. Um, and so uh, that's number one, why you're seeing uh, the, the, the kind of intense demonstrations, the, the size and scale of demonstrations that you're having. But it's also why um, I think it becomes really, really difficult with both allies and opponents uh, to overlay uh, some of the civility um, uh, dynamics that, that that I think are very important and I have real value for. Uh, um, it, it's just not. It's just not the same. And and one of the goals should be to to level that playing field, to make the stakes equal, either by lowering the stakes for African Americans, right, uh, uh, making it so that um, our lives are not uh, on the line consistently when we're talking about this, this, this kind of thing, or the alternative, which I don't think is quite as appealing, is to raise the stakes for other Americans uh, and, and make, it, make it so that white America has more to lose uh, in this conversation than they do right now. Now, how you, how you do that and whether you can do that in a way that moves it forward, I think it's really difficult to, to come across. But I think as we're watching all of this and trying to figure out what to do next, uh, I think that is one of the things that all of us has to keep in mind, um, that the stakes here just are not equal. Uh, they never have been um, and they won't be soon. And so uh, you've got to give a pretty wide berth, uh, I think, to, to, to these demonstrations, uh, to the calls for change. Um, uh, if you are not somebody who, who is looking at this as life or death for yourself, 
uh, or your family uh, or, or your kids or whoever. Um, the other thing uh, that, I, that I think is important is, again, um, uh, you know, a recognition of the level of change that needs to take place in order for this not to continue to happen. Um, uh, and, and, I'm, and there again, I think uh, there's not an equal recognition of that on both sides of this conversation. Um, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was a senior in college when Rodney King uh, was beaten by the LAPD on the side of a freeway. I wrote a column for my college newspaper where I was the editorial page editor about how the experience, the experiences I had with the police as a teenager here in Detroit in the late 1980s were exactly the same kinds of dynamics that led to those officers beating Rodney King on the side of the, uh, of the road. So that's what, 30 years ago now um, uh, that I was writing about that and experiencing that as the rest of the country was. Um, you know, you could go back uh, two or three generations in my, you know, in, um, in my family on either side and ask people about the same dynamics. So uh, the, the, the change that we're talking about, the, the, the reform that we're talking about, about goes so far beyond uh, what most people I think are ready or maybe even willing uh, to contemplate right now. And, um, and it's gonna be important uh, because of that, that we have uh, civil means to have that discussion. Uh, if we don't have civil means to have that discussion, uh, we're at the point where this is going to be a conflict and a sustained one. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of losses uh, all around. I mean, I really feel uh, like uh, this moment is, uh, is full of all kinds of accelerants that we don't see all the time uh, when things like this happen. And, uh, and there's a level of being fed up, of being tired, of having had enough uh, on the side of African Americans uh, that that uh, we're not going to be able to go back to just having things the way they were. So, uh, in order to get to get forward, we do have to have uh, civil vehicles to talk about how to change those things. But as I said in the open, that civility does depend on the stakes being the same on both sides, and we're not we're not there yet, um, and we haven't even begun to think of what a framework looks like for those things. Um, so those are some of the things that have been going through my mind uh, the last two weeks. So we have a few questions already that I'd love to throw out there. Um, the first one from Margaret says, how do you have civil conversations with those whose views actually oppress and harm others? Well, I mean, obviously there are, you are going to talk to pe with people who are just unapproachable because of their prejudices, their hatred, what have you. I think that's not most people. Uh, I think you are going to encounter people who have uh, opinions that you're strongly offended by, uh, but, but I don't know that that's the, that's an excuse, a reason to avoid a conversation. I mean, gaining understanding of where those opinions come from, I think, is the key to perhaps having a conversation that might bring change about. But simply avoiding those, you know, the conversation, I don't think it's a good answer. I mean, um, yeah, there are some that, uh, some people who are just, you know, you're not going to want to deal with. I don't think that's the case most of the time. And, you know, I, that person may look at you and be just and feel just as, as strongly about your views and the harm they perceive from those views. I think you've got to at least try to converse and try to converse in an honest way. Is that a good um, time to bring in the principle you guys have talked about before to ask where those views came from and try and well, that's, that's get the basic, a little? I mean, that's the foundation of the Civility Project, getting to know people um, beyond their political views, figuring out what values and experiences 
in their lives um, have shaped their viewpoints. Uh, you know, we've done this over and over, putting people together who come from different places and feel different about things and ask them to do what we did in that uh, StoryCorps project, just ask questions of each other, not about their political views, but about their experiences and their values. And you do that and most of the times you find out that person who you perceive to be evil or hateful because of their, their, their opinions um, came to their views the same, same way you do. Uh, by looking at the facts, applying their own experiences, their own values, their own, uh, you know, their, their own belief systems, and they come up with a different opinion. It doesn't make them evil. It doesn't make them stupid. And I think the first thing we do is stop attaching those sort of qualities to everyone we disagree with. You, you go on Twitter and you read the your comments from both the right and the left, it's not just, oh, I disagree. Oh, that person is, is a stupid moron who wants to destroy America. I mean, I think we wanna move beyond attaching those sort of evil characteristics to the people we disagree with and try to listen and try to understand what may be motivating their, their opinions. And you know, we, had, we did it, one of these sessions uh, on Mackinac we put together two ladies um, who uh, they walk every morning together and they starkly different. One was Republican, one was Democrat. And they, they walked together for like 10 years and never, and assiduously avoided discussing politics. You know, they talked about everything but politics and it worked fine for them. But when they sat down and started this, this, this discussion, this, this exercise of why do you think the things you think? I mean, they learn so much more about each other. And instead of sort of ending that, that friendship they had, that eggshell friendship they had, it brought them closer together. And I think that's the basic uh, principle of this. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that I, we've said from the beginning, um, uh, when we were talking about this project and talking about civility is, uh, that nobody has an obligation uh, to countenance uh, somebody else who uh, doesn't respect your rights, doesn't, uh, doesn't respect you as a human being, or means you harm. Uh, civility is not about that. It is not it's a sort of a call to accept uh, that level of uh, threat or, or even disrespect. Um, I think what we're trying to talk about is how we relate to each other um, in our own communities, uh, in, in the places where uh, we interact with, with, with uh, the people closest to us, uh, and, and how you uh, are able to, even within that intimate space, uh, figure out ways to include uh, people who, uh, who don't agree with you uh, and be able to talk to them, be able to talk to them uh, about the things you disagree about, uh, but also be able to know them beyond those disagreements, be able to say uh, we aren't the sum uh, of, those, of those disagreements. And I think that's a really important distinction to make right now as well. Um, some of what we're seeing uh, in, this, in this conflict that is going on right now in America is about people who don't respect other people's rights. It is about people who don't understand or, or don't even want to acknowledge uh, that the, there is a system of uh, gross racial inequality baked into, into this country that is intolerable for uh, African Americans. Um, and civility doesn't require you um, to, uh, again, to countenance that. It does not require you to take that. Um, uh, you have every right, uh, we all have every right uh, to define for ourselves how we push back against, uh, against that kind of oppression. Um, but we also, we also, again, need civil means to come up with what, what's next, what's the alternative uh, to all this. And all of our lives would be richer and a lot of these problems might not exist if more of us were able, even in those intimate spaces, our churches, uh, our neighborhoods, uh, uh, our school communities, 
um, to be able to uh, to broaden the scope of the people who are in those in those spaces that we deal with. Uh, that there should be more um, uh, civil disagreement uh, uh, that that can take place in those places without uh, this kind of uh, this the same kind of conflict. And Lynn, I would add to that. Um, you know, you've got to approach these conversations in the right spirit. Because if you do this honestly, if you do this uh, the right way, you're going to hear some things that may offend you. These conversations could be raw and they could be very, very painful. And if you shut it down as soon as someone says something that they don't realize is offensive, but it offends you mightily, uh, we're not, you, you, we're not going to get there. You've got to be learn to talk through that and, you know, to continue the conversation uh, and, and, and not, you know, just erupt and, and, and say, that's it. Uh, you know, I'm done with you. You, you know, you've got to be willing to take, you got to be willing to get your feelings hurt and because you're probably going to hurt the other person's feelings. So we have another question from Laura. She asked, how do you engage people who think they are receptive to varying opinions when in reality, they're just looking for an argument or platform to push their own opinion? <laughs> I would say the first step to that would be to make sure you're open to discussing other opinions. And I think too often we come into these uh, conversations thinking, thinking uh, that, uh, well, this is our opportunity to lecture, to convince, to convert. You know, Steve and I go and these all, have these discussions all the time. I have never once felt I might convert him or convince him of the error of his ways. But we keep having the conversations and we keep learning. So make sure your mind's in the right place. Because if you go in thinking, well, I'm 100% right and I'm going to fix that other person, that's not going to get either one of you where you need to be, you know, come in with the right mindset, uh, open mind, and this, the, with, with the goal of learning from the other person, not necessarily agreeing, but learning. Yeah, and uh, one of the things we talk about all the time with uh, civility, one of the other uh, really important dynamics um, is this idea of listening, of, of active listening. Um, and I think most of us, uh, tend to think that we're great listeners, right? Uh, that that we're really good at at um, taking in what somebody that we're talking to is is saying, um, uh, even when it's something that we don't agree with. But um, but I think in, in a lot of cases, and I even catch myself uh, in this in this trap from time to time. Um, we we think of listening as just not talking, right? Well, I'm not talking, so I'm listening. Uh, to that person, uh, but but oftentimes what what I'm really doing is sitting and thinking. Well, what am I going to say back uh, when that person stops talking? Um, and and that's actually not listening. Um, uh, I th there's an intentional um, uh, way of of actually sort of uh, shutting yourself down, really, uh, to to be able to listen to what somebody else is saying, really listen to what they're saying in the sense that you're trying to really understand where they're coming from uh, and how it differs from what, from what you think. Um, and it takes practice. I mean, it, it, it is something, again, that you've got to kind of do intentionally because I think a lot of human instinct is, um, is, to, is to just not talk and think, well, I'm listening. Um, uh, and, and that's, big part of uh, what that question sort of gets at. Yeah, you got to be able to walk away and say, you know, here are the three things that other person said that I found significant. And you, I can't tell you how many conversations, if, if you do that exercise, we walk away, we can't remember the three things because we were too busy trying to get our own point across. We have another question. It's a little bit long. It's from Lindsay. And she says, I've seen a lot of close, close-minded posts on social media from acquaintances or family members denying white privilege and stating that all lives matter. She wants to be an ally and address these misconceptions when she sees them, but it's difficult to do so in a way that actually leads to civil discussion or awakening on their part. 
how can we format responses to be palatable or effective when we see misguided and hurtful posts like this? I think this, the answer is about the same as this question as they were to the last, you know. Uh, find, so, a way to, find a way to have an honest conversation that's not a lecture, because people don't like to be lectured. Um, you know, this, this reminds me of some of the, 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 the conversations that I've had over the last couple of weeks with people about what to do and how to do it and, um, and you know, how we get past the point uh, where we are. Uh, and, I think, and I think there are a lot of people who find themselves in, in these kinds of situations where uh, they have friends or they have family members who are now surfacing uh, uh, opinions and, and approaches that they may not have, uh, that you may not have known about uh, before. The thing that I'm actually um, telling a lot of people that I think the, the moment sort of calls all of us to um, is is um, is vigilance, right? First of all, right? Uh, uh, don't shy from pointing out that uh, that this is wrong or or that you that you don't agree with it, and that and that these kinds of opinions uh, absolutely are part of the architecture of uh, systemic racism and inequality and they are they are a big problem i mean uh, people who don't believe that there is such a thing as white privilege are uh, are just as dangerous as those who are fighting uh, tooth and nail to pre to preserve it um but i'm also really encouraging everybody um i think the the the, the thing we all have the most power over is ourselves and the immediate world that we operate in. And I think everybody has the opportunity to sit and really think about the ways in which your life reflects uh, the, the systemic inequality that, that keeps uh, African Americans and others uh, back in this society. And uh, I, I think the worry about relatives who are, you know, ignorant or, and surfacing that ignorance is important, but far more, far more critical to the change that we're talking about is uh, is everybody being able to identify the parts of their own lives uh, that contribute to this. Um, and that's hard. That's really hard because I think uh, there are a lot of folks who walk around thinking, "Well, there's no part of my life that." Uh, is about privilege or uh, is is reflective of racial inequality um, and, and I think for almost anybody if you really sat and examined um, you'd find that that's not so uh, and that is that's the critical mass that we've got to move toward where there is this uh, overwhelming recognition that all of our lives in this in this society reflect uh, this baked in uh, racist inequality that, that uh, you know, America is founded on. Um, and, and in order for it to change, we all have to first recognize that that's true um, and we gotta be willing to change it. And some of those changes are gonna be uncomfortable. I mean, there's just no other way to, to talk about it. Some of these changes are not gonna sit well with an awful lot of people. So Chris asked uh, Stephen and Nolan, are there any major changes of mind that either of you have made as a result of your conversations or one of you convincing the other in any way? Well, I think basically we're still who we were when we started and our beliefs are the same, but you know, there, and I can't think, you know, I can't tell you the specific instances, but uh, many of my conversations with Steve have have led me to uh, refine my views, let's say, if not change them, but to add a, another layer of perspective to them. And I think that's the point of having these conversations. Uh, you know, you want to uh, focus your own uh, thinking, your own feelings, uh, and be open to uh, adding elements or changing elements. I mean, fundamentally, we're the, we come, we are in the same position uh, we were at the start. But you know, I for one can say 
that yeah, I've I've uh, got a little better perspective on a number of issues because I took the time to have serious discussions, civil discussions with someone I disagreed with. You know, I, I, I would I would agree that I don't know that we we ever fully change each other's minds, but I, but I do think that one of the things that that has uh, happened a number of times uh, over the time that we've known each other is that um, that we discover that we actually both want the same outcome uh, to, to a, a challenge or an issue uh, and that the disagreement lies in the path to that to that solution um, and um, and I think that's an actually an important realization right uh, that that we share a desire for things in in a particular uh, in a particular argument to be the same way, we just don't think uh, that the solutions uh, that, that, that the other person has is, is the right way. The, the, the one that jumps out at me uh, the most is, boy, I don't remember how long this was, uh, how long ago this was, eight years um, uh, when we were, when there was a, a, a debate about having a constitutional convention here in, mm -hmm. in Michigan. Um, and, um, and I was very much in favor that I still am very much in favor of, and I still can come up with examples every week uh, in Lansing of stuff that doesn't work the way it's supposed to, or stuff that just, you know, uh, that never worked, um, uh, that could have been fixed by the, that constitutional convention. And I won't remember what the issue was uh, at, at the time, uh, but there was something that Nolan and I both agreed was really screwed up uh, in 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 Lansing and was causing all kinds of problems. Um, I thought that the Constitutional Convention would have fixed that. It would have. I mean, almost certainly. Um, Nolan didn't think it was uh, worth the gamble. He thought that uh, um, that opening up the entire Constitution to 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 a rewrite would put all kinds of other things at risk. You'd get all kinds of special interests in there doing Lord knows what. Um, but it was really a, a a moment of, of realization that, hey, we really do agree on this one issue or some of these issues. We just don't want to do it the same way. We don't want to, we don't want to fix it in the same way. And I think that realization uh, uh, gives you a, a sense that, you know, somebody you disagree with is not necessarily an enemy, right? They're not necessarily just opposed to you. They, they may have a different set of ideas about how to fix something. So um, before I go to the next couple of questions that are sitting there, I just want to remind everybody in our last uh, 17 or so minutes, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And um, so then we will get to it before the time is up. Um, Chris wanted to know, Nolan, what do you believe about white privilege? Well, I think, you know, this question I've thought a lot about, and obviously uh, there is white privilege in this country. It's easier to be white than black. But I would also say as someone born in Appalachia to a poor family, uneducated parents, a house without run, running water, you know, it's, you know, I look at privilege as a more layered thing. I think there's also economic privilege. And I think whether you're white or black, if you're born poor and you're born in a place where attaining education is difficult, you're not, you're not as privileged perhaps as some of the other people who, who, who may look like you. I think there's education privilege uh, as well. If you have access to a good education and had the opportunity to, to go to a top rate college, uh, you know, you got your ticket stamped perhaps. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think applying this, this blanket thing that uh, across the board that all, you know, I, you know, I saw someone wrote the other day, the poorest of whites is more pr privileged than, you know, any African-American. I think that's just, that's not, that doesn't reflect my experience. Having been born in a place, the place I was born and still seeing the enormous poverty and lack of opportunity and inequality in uh, the, the rural uh, impoverished areas of this country. Those are tough to get out of. Uh, it's tough for, you know, an average kid. I think similarly to, you know, the, the urban, the urban um, communities where 
and the urban poor and the, the, amongst the rural poor, an average kid has, is not going to succeed. Uh, where I live now, an average kid is going to succeed. It, has, it takes an extraordinary kid to get out of, the, of that place. And, you know, I see, still have family there, still have a home there, and I see constantly good kids having their dreams busted and not being able to, to get out because of the circumstances of their birth. And I would, you know, I would, uh, you know, urge people to consider that, you know, not all white people uh, belong, to, belong to country clubs. A lot of poverty in the Upper Peninsula, Appalachia, uh, other areas of rural America where opportunity is non-existent. So, uh, okay. Yeah, there's no question that, that there are all kinds of inequalities that, that exist in, in America. But, 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 you know, one of the things that no one, what no one's talking about here, I think is one of the real problems we have with defining and dealing with white privilege. And it's that, it's that white people, when they think about white privilege, uh, they think of it as, as they think the proof of it must be something that is, uh, is better for them uh, uh, than, than for African Americans. That's actually not the way it works. Uh, you have a privilege just being white. Uh, and, and it's not just about opportunity. It's just about life. Uh, you can walk around the streets without the fear of uh, the open discrimination that African Americans face uh, just because of who they are. Uh, uh, Christian Cooper is watching birds in Central Park uh, and a white woman sees him and, and when he says, you gotta put your dog on a leash, uh, she calls the weight of 400 years of racial violence against black men uh, uh, up into the conversation it says, I'm calling the cops, telling them that the black man's threatening me in Central Park, uh, knowing full well uh, that that um, that call might result in in gross bodily harm to this to this man who's done nothing. Um, uh, it's white. I, I always I always think that the word privilege is is difficult in this in this context because privilege. Uh, implies that you're getting something, that you're getting something that everyone else is not. Uh, and, and really what is going on is that black people are just being denied all kinds of things that white people, by virtue of being white, are afforded. Uh, and that doesn't mean that every white person gets uh, everything that they, that they want or that every white person has an unfettered path to success or wealth. It just means that every black person is denied the equality of that uh, opportunity. And whether, whether they're born uh, in Beverly Hills uh, or in, in, in Harlem, uh, it, 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 it is uh, a universal uh, denial of equality that black people face. And so when, you call, when we call it privilege, I think it puts people on the defensive because a lot of white people look at their lives and they say, well, there hadn't been a whole lot of privilege for me, right? Like no one said, no one's born in, in Appalachia. I spent the first uh, two years of my career reporting in, in Appalachia and learned all kinds of things uh, about poverty and uh, isolation that I would never have learned growing up here in Detroit. And it's no joke. I mean, people born in those circumstances are absolutely disadvantaged, but they are not disadvantaged um, uh, in the way that African Americans are, uh, and and they can ex they can escape those disadvantages, uh, as Nolan is a good example of, uh, through things like hard work and luck. Uh, there's no amount of hard work. There's no amount of luck that would make Christian Cooper not a black man that Amy Cooper was afraid of because uh, he's watching birds in Central Park. Uh, it's just different, and and we've got to get white America. To, to understand that uh, and recognize it, but um, but frankly, I think um, one of the one of the problems is the word.
privilege. It puts people on the defensive because they don't feel that way. Uh, and we're really not talking about how privileged they are. We're talking about the systemic denial of opportunity uh, and equality for us. I would hope that what, what, whatever we do to address inequality uh, in America, it doesn't stop at the racial lines and it goes to across the economic class line. Because I'm telling you, the people, uh, the rural poor in America, white or black, but particularly the white rural poor America, feel invisible. And they don't feel that there's a way out. And they're, they're you, know, you call it what you will, call it disadvantaged or whatever. They're extremely disadvantaged by, by the fact that people don't believe they exist. Because when people have conversations about poor people in the country, and I'll use Joe Biden as example when he, you know, when he, when he talked about poor people and white people, uh, you know, as if, you know, poor means is the is the same as being black. And there are a lot of poor white people and in this country uh, living in places where they, you know, getting out is a crapshoot, and nobody wants to talk about them. Nobody wants to see them. Uh, they're basically invisible in this country. So we just need to move along a little bit. Um, really great points and people in the chat are recommending the book White Fragility. Um, there's a lot of support for the conversation we're having. We just have a few questions that I really want to get to before okay. um, we finish our session here. So, um, all right. So Lisa said she thinks that some are so scared to say the wrong thing or be misinterpreted or misrepresented that they don't speak up at all and that that doesn't help. So how do we remedy that? Well, I think that's the, the that's the, going to be the, the basic challenge here because it is a, a fraught uh, conversation. Say the wrong thing. And, you know, even if it, 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 you don't realize you're saying the wrong thing or you don't intend any harm, say the wrong thing. We've seen examples over and over and over and it can ruin your life, certainly ruin your career. People aren't going to be willing to take that chance until we diffuse the risk in the conversations. You know, we have to be able to have, find a comfortable place where we can talk honestly and people get a chance to say the wrong thing and learn that it was the wrong thing rather than, hey, I'm not going to say anything because if I slip up, I'm gone. And we're not, we're not gonna have healthy conversations uh, on this subject, particularly until we open up and leave a little room for people to make mistakes. Yeah, and again, I mean, people will be more willing to do that when they feel, again, like the stakes are equal, when we're on a level playing field. And you know what you're seeing right now uh, in the streets are, are people who don't feel like they're on a level playing field uh, and they're not. Um, uh, and until we can get to the space where uh, we're addressing that, where they feel as though that is being addressed, it's going to be really hard to have those conversations. Uh, um, one of the things I have said consistently about civility is that um, it's also civil to say, um, we disagree so strongly about this right now, and we are so far apart in, in the ways in which we see this and in the ways in, uh, we can assess what's at stake for us, that right now is not the time to talk. Um, uh, it's okay to walk away and say, I can't be civil about this right now because I, I, I don't feel like uh, an equal partner in the conversation. Um, and the civil part of that to me is a the, the walking away instead of staying and letting it devolve into a, a, a terrible unproductive argument. But it's also in saying I'm not walking away for good. Right. I'm not walking away and saying I will not talk to you about this or I will never be able to talk to you about this. Uh, you know, there are lots of times when Nolan and I reach a point where we just got to stop talking about something uh, or that it's just not time to talk about something because one of us or both of us are in a space where there's nothing productive to be gained from continuing to have the conversation. But when we reach that point, uh, we also say, I'll be back. Like, I'm not walking away from you forever because of this disagreement. I'm not saying that we can't talk about this ever. I'm saying we can't do it now. Uh, and I think uh, we may be at a point like that right now in America. I mean, I. I know an awful lot of people who feel that way. 
uh, you know, I think a lot of us watching the demonstrations relate to that sentiment that, you know, it's enough. Uh, it's enough. And we're not going back to what we had before. Um, and, and until we can uh, piece together uh, what the constructive way is forward, um, maybe it's not time to talk. Um, and, and that's a hard decision to make, but, but I think that there are a lot of people um, who are falling into that, into that space right now. So um, Mariah asked Stephen, what is your opinion of what other African-Americans and allies to this issue can do to help specifically regarding issues with police brutality in suburban areas of Michigan? Um, well, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think that fits inside the, 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 the bigger question about what we do about police, right? It's not police in suburbs, uh, it's police in general. It's, it's the, the, the construction of uh, of police departments uh, as a separate independent authority, essentially enforcing the law against the citizens that they are supposed to be protecting. Um, um, that's what we are, I think, called to rethink right now. Um, you know, this idea of defunding the police, which I think is one of the worst names anyone has ever come up for anything, um, because it actually doesn't describe what they're talking about doing. Um, and what they're talking about is really important, which is to say, do we need an occupying force in every city that sees itself as having this really independent kind of authority, not accountable uh, to the people they serve uh, until after they do something brutal? I mean, that's one of the things that, that I think is, uh, has come out of this that's really key is we only try to hold police accountable after they've done something terrible. Uh, they've killed somebody or they've harmed somebody. Uh, we need to talk about what are the ways that police feel accountable to their communities while they are on the street, while they're responding uh, to, to, to crises. Uh, should there be a, a way to advocate for citizens' rights while police are doing their jobs? Um, um, what would that look like? Uh, those are the kinds of things that I think that uh, that we're getting to. Uh, as for what we can do as individuals, I mean, again, I think we all have to look at our look at our lives um, and look at the places where this stuff plays out, uh, and look at our role in all of it. I mean, white America especially, but I also mean African Americans. I mean. Um, there are parts of all of our lives that connect to these things, uh, and, and we've all got to we've all got to take a look around and say, "I'm willing to change that, right? I'm willing to to do that differently um, in order to stop all of this." Uh, and and I again, I don't think that's an easy process. I think there's a lot of stuff that a lot of us are dependent on, uh, or or like as part of our lives that are part of this system of inequality. And if we really are serious about changing it, I think we all have to embrace the idea that we can be different and we can live differently. Um, uh, and, and that's African Americans, that's allies, uh, and ultimately it needs to even be the folks who uh, sit on the other side. We have got to get, um, we've got to get everybody to that space or this will not stop and and um uh, that's the outcome i think that that uh, that african americans in particular have decided is not acceptable uh, hey lynn in regards to police um if i can just add one thing one thought i wrote a decade ago when this whole idea of selling military surplus equipment to police departments or giving it to them not selling you know, I wrote a, a decade ago that this is a bad thing, that all of this, these tanks and these heavy weaponry um, would not improve policing, but would lead to you know, the, the police considering themselves a, a sort of um, adjunct of the military. I mean, you got this big shiny thing now sitting in the, in the back uh, room or in the garage of the police compound, you're gonna wanna use it. And I think all of this military equipment that started going from from the army and the to the local police department was not 
it was not a good idea and it's still not a good idea. Well, it's interesting because when I visited England a couple of years ago, the police force is not um, armed. And that was really- the populace. Yeah. Neither the populace. So, right, and so, so it's just really like- equivalent. It was, it was glaring. So we have a, a question I'd like to um, end on. And then before we finish, and there's just so many great comments in the, in the chat and I wish we could go on a lot longer. Um, but before we finish, I do want to um, hand it over for a few minutes to Chris um, to say a few things. But I just want to um, finish with a question from Jen who said, to achieve equality, whether it's racial or economic, we need to care about each other enough to act differently. To care about each other, we need to know each other. So how do we get together to hear each other's stories and finally get to that point. And before you answer, I just want to tell everybody who is here, and thank you so much for being here, that we are um, starting to send out a monthly newsletter to continue conversations like this and give tips and opportunities for you to, to step by step start building civility in, in your neck of the woods. And so if you'd like to be on our list, um, please do let me know and I'll make sure to add you. But um, Nolan and Steven, how do, we, how do we get together to hear each other's stories and finally get to that point of caring? Well, people are willing. It's not hard to do. I mean, you pick the right place, right circumstances. Don't have these conversations at work. Uh, you know, make sure you're in a place where each person is comfortable. You're not ambushing someone. Uh, make it an intentional conversation. Hey, I'd like to know more about what you think. Can we sit down sometime and have an honest conversation? Uh, and, you know, take the fear and the risk out of it. Uh, don't lecture, listen, things we've been talking about, but you know, just pick the right place and be intentional. Yeah, and, and think about, you know, uh, we're talking right now in this country about big systemic changes that, um, that are gonna take a lot of effort to, to, to come up with solutions to and, um, and things that could take time and, and, uh, and be difficult. I think uh, it can be overwhelming, right? Um, and and I would encourage everybody to think about, in addition to these big things, which are hard and that we're working on, to think about individual things you can do. Uh, think about the individuals in your life um, that you can reach out to to have this conversation with, to try to to try to uh, reach a better understanding about who they are. And why do you think uh, what they do? Um, uh, you know, um, like Nolan said, workplace is probably not the best place to do it, but think about your school community or your church community or your neighborhood um, and where the opportunities are to, to build a relationship with somebody who you might not automatically think of as a candidate uh, for, that kind of, uh, for that kind of exchange. Um, before we're done, I, I want to say something um, about the, the, the relationship between uh, me and Nolan. Um, you know, I mean, these have been, these have been some tough months uh, for everybody. Uh, this is the craziest time that I think any of us ha have been alive for. Uh, and if there was anything that, uh, that could have, I think, brought us to the, to the brink in terms of uh, our relationship, it's the things that have happened. Um, but I, I, I want to say that that even though Nolan and I still have fundamental disagreements about things like white privilege, uh, about inequality, I have heard him say things in the last week about systemic racism, about dismantling systemic racism, about his understanding of systemic racism that I didn't hear before from him and didn't know that he thought or know that he believed. Uh, I mean, again, we still have a, a huge gap between the two of us and an important one. Uh, but, but I want to acknowledge that, that um, you know, he has a deeper understanding of this um, than, than I might have acknowledged before or thought or, or certainly would have seen on, on display. And I think that is the key to this kind of relationship. If I didn't know Nolan very well, uh, if we didn't have a relationship, I wouldn't have had the opportunity uh, to see those things. Um, and that really, that really matters. Uh, uh, it really changes my perspective on things. I think it changes his perspective on things and it makes it possible for us to do something like this where, you know, he says something that I think is pretty outrageous about right, 
white privilege <laughs> and I don't lose my mind. <laughs> uh, and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> you no. know, I, I will say this, you know, I, I talked a little bit about my background, but it, I think it was, it, it, you know, I was uh, in the rural South in the 60s and in the 50s. It's hard for me to deny that racism exists. I saw it. You know, I, our car, uh, I remember being in the car with my family as a young boy when, when we were stopped a, at a Ku Klux Klan checkpoint. Uh, they were trying to literature to pass out flyers. And so they had a roadblock in the road stopping every car. And I remember my dad's fury over that. I mean, it's everybody's experience is different. And, you know, you, I saw a lot of segregation and harmful things there. But I will tell you, when we came up here, I saw more segregation in Metro Detroit and uh, perhaps not more segregation, but the more of the damages of segregation here than I did there because we had to live together there. We were close in, pro in physical proximity. Here, you, it was possible to live in a, back then, to live in a suburb and go your whole, you know, go months and not see a person who didn't look like you. And, you know, it was always, it is always, you know, I've always believed that poor whites and African Americans have more in common than perhaps any two groups of people. And it's always baffled me why they can't get along better. I mean, if, in terms of food, religion, culture, we have much more in common than we have in difference. And the thing that's keeping us apart is just ignorance, you know, and a lack of trying. So um, I really want to thank everybody for being here and thank Delta Dental for making all of this possible. And I'd like to hand uh, the mic over to Chris before we finish um, for any parting words. 20 seconds, then Dewan, maybe you can end with 20. <laughs> Nolan, Stephen, thank you for your friendship. I'm inspired. Thank you for what you did here today. The only sad thing for me is that we're not going to be able to drink bourbon together on Madison <laughs> Island, but next year it's coming. Next and, year, we'll do a double. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next week, um, Dewan and I are going to do a deep dive where he's going to be the lead on how to be yourself, uh, how to be brave enough to be yourself in spaces where you're not sure you're welcome. Dewan, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, so please join us. Um, I think one of the things that I am passionate about is oftentimes I see very talented, um, very accomplished Black people in positions um, of influence in different organizations, different settings, and they experience, what I see is they, they check the authentic version of themselves at the door oftentimes, for fear of not being welcome. So that thing that we discussed today where people are scared that they're going to say the wrong thing and it might cost them a friendship or it might cost somebody saying something really harsh to them on Facebook in response, like, Black people have learned to navigate and live in that space, right? In hopes that it wouldn't, like being themselves wouldn't cost them job or career opportunity. I did want to say one thing that, that I noticed in the story that Nolan shared, right? Uh, that I'd like to point out. Like, I think that an, an example of white privilege is, had that been somebody else that got stopped at that checkpoint um, that you were at, Nolan Finley, it would have been a different outcome. They wouldn't be on here telling that story today, right? Oh, I'm certain of it. Um, yeah. You know, I told that just, um, just, you know, as to sort of inform on, you know, what my experiences were and my, my views of uh, yeah. the differences between whites and blacks and, you know, having watched it firsthand in the South in the 60s wasn't a pretty thing. No, I, and, I, and I, we appreciate the story. I, I mean, I just, just wanted to point that out. One exercise I'd like to, that I use that I'd like to share with people that had a, a question is, when having a discussion with somebody and it's uncomfortable and it's awkward, what, I, what I've, I've learned to do is take the perspective and put the perspective in a corner, separate from the person, right? And if you take the, if you take the person and put them in a the corner, off, they have to defend themselves, right? So it's like, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a lot of pushback. But if you let them know that it's their perspective that hurt you or offended you, and you're sitting there holding them with your hand on their back, and you're saying, this is how that impacted me, um, 
oftentimes you can unpack that together and get to some common ground and they don't feel like attacked, right? But it, it will be equally as uncomfortable and awkward. Um, but I just found it a good practice that I'd, I'd like to share with people that do that question out there. Again, thank everybody for joining. Uh, we appreciate it. We hope that some of you guys will check us out uh, next week. Stephen, Nolan, this has been great. Um, I've been considered a privilege to have sat here and, and, and see what you guys do up close. And for and us. This. Thank you so much for having us, Juan and Chris. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks, everybody, great. for being here. Have a great day. Let's go. Thank, Delta you, Delta. Delta. Thank you, Delta Dental, one more time. We love Thanks, you guys. Delta Dental, yes, absolutely.